Thank you, Dr. Merck, for joining us today. Let's get right into it. Can you tell us how you got involved and why you got interested in veterinary forensics? I got involved in Atlanta, actually, back in 2002, 2001. What happened was the Georgia state had passed new animal cruelty laws and in, in the year 2000. The problem was no one was investigating or prosecuting. So there was a group formed called Georgia Legal Professionals for Animals, and I joined that group. And the mandate was to provide free education to the key players, which was law enforcement, prosecutors, and veterinarians. So I started working with medical examiners and forensic scientists, forensic entomologists, pathologists, and learning, trying to learn their fields and see how it could, if at all, apply to animals. Can you tell us where some of the overlap lies between human and veterinary forensic science disciplines? Yeah, there, there is some overlap with human and animal forensics in the, in the various disciplines and that a lot of them can be applied to animals or they're using animals already in human forensic science research, they're using animal models. Now, a lot of those are pigs and it may or may not apply to dogs and cats, but now they're doing more and more uh, research on those different species so that we can say, yes, the insects respond the same way on cats and dogs as they do on pigs and animals. Pathology, there's a lot of similarity on forensic pathology um, in, in that animals get the same injuries, the same responses uh, to uh, trauma in, in certain ways. Blood stain analysis, uh, forensic entomology, um, microscopy, the use of, um, of fur or hair to identify similar characteristics between animals. DNA analysis is a big one uh, that we use in some of our cases. And there's certainly um, animal DNA labs now, forensic labs. And then anthropology, forensic anthropology, there's a lot of, of overlap in the analysis of bones and looking for trauma. It's fascinating just how similar these can be, but now tell us how these two disciplines are different. The biggest distinct difference is, is that animals respond to trauma differently. They're not made to bleed from their skin the same way as we do. Uh, they're made to survive outside. Um, so that definitely will impact um, crime scene reconstruction, blood stain pattern analysis, because it's not the same. Also, uh, that the same issue with bleeding applies to surface bruising. Visible bruising is rarely seen in animals. And when it is seen, it, it, it indicates significant trauma. Animals just don't bruise easily. Most of their trauma, if they're going to have damage blood vessels, which is the cause of bruising, it's underneath the skin and not necessarily visible. The behavior of animals makes it difficult for human experts to um, analyze crime scenes, for example, or it can cause some reluctance to get to fully involve themselves in cases because we know what humans do because we're the same species. So we can predict behavior, know where to look for evidence. But animals' behavior is different, and so where they look for evidence or how they analyze or interpret the findings at a scene um, is directly impacted by the species of that animal um, and their age and so forth. One big difference in anthropology or really forensic osteology, the analysis of bones, is that in animals we can find um, findings on the bones that are unique to dog fighting. Um, we have issues with predators. So the issues we see with animals, how they live, how they behave, the things that could uh, cause trauma or get the animal in trouble are different than in humans. When did your investigation start on these cases? Ideally at the beginning, um, but unfortunately that doesn't happen. The, the veterinarian being involved at the scene is, is ideal uh, because we know what is missing as well as what is the probative or exculpatory value of certain pieces of evidence. So the, the veterinarian on scene, or at least to evaluate the crime scene photos and video is critical, um, certainly to examine the animals. But anytime you've got a legal case involving animals, um, whether it's um, an animal attack on a human or so it can be civil or criminal charges, a veterinarian should really be involved. Um, what, one of the biggest mistakes I've seen is on uh, burials or where they find deceased animals, uh, surface remains, and they just dig it up. And we actually 
should excavate the way that we do for human cases um, using archaeological techniques. And so mistakes are made in that respect. And also law enforcement doesn't tend to know that we can gather a, a lot of information from deceased, even decomposed animals, and certainly from bones. And so we see mistakes made where they don't excavate them um, or they may bury deceased animals themselves on the scene, not recognizing that veterinarians could actually uh, provide valuable information. Can you tell us about some of the times you've had to partner with human forensic scientists on a case? Yes, there's been recently actually several cases where human forensic experts have actually been on scene or worked together with uh, myself on uh, some either large scale cases or um, more horrific, uh, more um, horrific type of cases. The one big case is the Whistler sled dog case. And that was up in British Columbia uh, where we had information that a man had uh, killed um, approximately 70 dogs, 70 to 100 dogs um, over a two day period and then buried them in mass graves. And we found out this information approximately nine months after the fact. We used the university, Simon Fraser University, and gathered forensic anthropologists, world renowned forensic archaeologists uh, from the US and Canada, and gathered teams together along with veterinarians. And we excavated those graves over approximately a week period. We developed a um, on scene necropsy um, area. So we started doing field necropsies, which are autopsies of animals. And what we had there was a variable um, degrees of decomposition. So we had fresh bodies and then that were perfectly preserved in the, from the freezing temperatures. And then we had decomposition. By having um, the forensic anthropologist there, we could get directly on site consultations. And they remarked later that that wasn't the norm for them when they work on human cases, that there is a segregation of pathology and, um, in anthropology, so that was a big one. And the students were excellent with the archeology span and the excavation. It was a lot of um, disciplines there, including uh, forensic entomology. Another interesting case was one in Florida, and it was a domestic violence case, and it involved a man who used a meat cleaver on his girlfriend's dog. So there was a tremendous amount of blood patterns and blood stains throughout the home. And so I consulted with my blood stain pattern analysis instructor, Anita Zanin, who um, then we looked at the photos. We weren't actually at the scene, but an analysis of that scene together was critical because she didn't know how animals bled, what their clotting time was. Um, we had blood clots in the cast off. So that was, that was a critical case. And he actually pled guilty and went to prison for three years. When you're investigating an animal's death or, or abuse case, what exactly can the animal's body tell you about what happened? Do you do cause and manner like a medical examiner? Yes, we do, except that in animals, of course, we don't have suicide or homicide. So the categories that we use are still um, the accidental or natural or undetermined, but instead of homicide or suicide, we use um, non-accidental injury is our category that we use. We aren't trained, um, nor do we have the, the laws necessarily to be able to interpret and make a legal cause as far as for most jurisdictions, it's whether or not it's animal cruelty or not, and whether it's felony or misdemeanor. And we can't make that determination really. So we, we stay with non-accidental injury. And the, the animal's body can tell us a lot of information. It's um, always amazing to me um, between um, what we know on the human side, for example, in asphyxia, we still can see the petechial hemorrhages in the face area, but instead of it being on the skin, what we see it is in the eyes and it's typically very mild compared to humans. And then we can see one or two areas of petechial hemorrhages in the mouth and under the tongue. So the, the findings are there, but in animals, they tend to be more subtle. So if you can't legally say it was animal neglect or something like that caused by a human, who does make that call legally? 
that is usually made by the prosecutor. So they look at the all the investigation findings, um, the witness statements, the defendant statement, if they make or a suspect statement, and then they take our examination if it's non-accidental injury and it's consistent with the alleged events or that it could they feel comfortable in charging it, that's how they will then determine how and what to charge. There's such a variety now and it's inconsistent between states, but we may have a torture statute. There may be a, um, a requirement to have pain or suffering. Some require both. So it depends on what the our reports are, what we find, and also what the investigation findings are. Dog fighting, for example, it's never just on the animal examination, ever. It's always a, a compilation of all the investigation findings that the totality of that evidence makes it more likely than not that the animals were used in, for animal fighting and that the suspect was engaged in illegal dog fighting. What kind of tools do you use in your investigations and have you had to adapt any for the field? There's really not anything uh, made specially for forensics for animals. There's, we use the same tools. We use alternate light source, uh, UV light. Uh, most veterinary hospitals have UV light because we use it to help diagnose uh, fungal infections on skin. So uh, there's not really a lot that we use differently, except there is something um, called thermal imaging. We use forward looking infrared cameras if they're available. Um, to look for areas of trauma in live animals. And this is a technology that is used by law enforcement, the military, building inspectors, uh, fire departments to look for heat on anything that the camera is scanning, and so hot and cold temperatures. And then it's also used in veterinary medicine. There's special cameras made just for animals uh, to look for signs of fever or trauma. And we'll use it in horses, especially evaluating lameness, We'll use it in agility trials with dogs. It's been used in the Olympics. The USDA is using it to um, examine horses that may have been um, had caustic substances put on their feet for it's called soaring for certain types of uh, shows. Uh, you, we tend to see that in the walking type horses. And then we use it in wildlife and uh, zoo medicine. So this is a technology we're using in a different way. The value of it is because animals don't bruise, we can use thermal imaging to see areas of inflammation. And that may be the only thing that can tell us there was blunt force trauma. The problem also is, is that animals have a really good response to inflammation and, and healing. So the inflammation may not last very long. So that is one thing that I think is more unique. There's unique testing um, that we may or may not see in humans. Starvation is a big, um, issue in animal cruelty cases, uh, neglect being one of the most common things that we see charged with for abuse. But um, with deceased animals, what we can do is run a, what's called a bone marrow fat percentage analysis. And that bone marrow fat percentage will be low in end stage starvation, but it does require the animal to already be deceased. In human cases, Traditionally, we're looking for DNA on a water bottle or a cigarette butt. In animal cases, where are you collecting DNA? One of the things that law enforcement should remember is that no one can come into a scene where there's been an animal or is an animal without walking out with some kind of evidence on them. It may be fur, um, it may be feces. Um, so the key things to look for are their, the bottoms of their clothes, their, their pants and their shoes and their socks, because we can get DNA from animal feces, um, urine, if and, uh, they walk through that, if they walk through a yard, chances are they picked up some kind of animal evidence. Are there any databases currently being used to compare things like DNA or hair from different breeds? Yes, there's several DNA labs. Um, that are animal dedicated, uh, UC Davis um, Veterinary Genetics Lab has probably the largest database of for different species of DNA. They also have uh, what's called a canine CODIS. This was developed after um, a large scale uh, dog fighting, multi-state dog fighting case that we did with the federal government in 2009. And what we were looking for is can we develop a database 
just for dog fighting that could be used as an investigative or prosecuting tool? And can we link other people together through their, their dogs and their puppies um, when they claim they don't know each other? Um, so that's what we did in this case. We had 26 different scenes um, and 400 dogs. So we had 26 different sets of, sus of, of suspects and we wanted to see if we could link them. And so we developed with UC Davis, a database and algorithm and we were able to link them together through first or second generation breeding. So that helped for, to obtain um, plea agreements. Then there's for hair and fur, there is databases. There's federal databases at the FBI and at the Federal Wildlife Lab in Oregon. Primarily the, the wildlife lab is only used for issues that violate the federal wildlife laws and regulations, um, but the FBI definitely has a database. Some of the more private labs that do microscopy have databases or access to them. And then there was a uh, more general database called Hairbase that was announced in uh, 2009, I believe, at the Academy of Forensic Science Conference. Um, so to start building more databases, but it's it's new and it's growing. We've seen animal abuse cases hitting the headlines recently. Can you talk to us a little bit about why you feel people are more apt to report cases like this now? I think we're seeing more reported in the media, especially more reported cases of animal cruelty. And then we're seeing more prosecutions and investigations. So it's multifactorial. Um, we're seeing uh, more community policing, more awareness, more of the public recognizing there might be something going on here. Um, from the social work side, um, we're seeing more recognition of the link between family violence, domestic violence, interpersonal violence, and animal abuse. So we see more cross-reporting and vice versa from those that investigate animal cases they're reporting more of child endangerment or elder abuse or domestic violence. We're seeing more animal law conferences and courses taught at the law school. So we're getting, we're getting new generations coming through of lawyers, um, of attorneys, of prosecutors, hopefully judges soon. Um, so we're seeing more of that. And then lately um, in the last year, we've had uh, the National Sheriff's Association and the FBI announced, you know, that animal cruelty is now going to be part of the VICAP, you know, questionnaire that it's going to be, we're going to be tracking it. There, there's this tremendous swell of, of um, awareness and, and I would say engagement and learning more that we have veterinarians that could do this. We're seeing more vet schools start to incorporate at least lectures, if not full courses. There's three or four vet schools now that have courses in this topic. So it's still in its infancy. Um, I think where we're headed is that eventually we'll see um, animal court. Um, it takes a special prosecutor and it's unique in developing and presenting a case of animal abuse. Um, and it takes a special judge. You know, these are cases that bother even the most seasoned uh, law enforcement. So I think that's where we're gonna move toward like we see family court. Dr. Merck, what advice would you give to someone who's looking to maybe go into veterinary forensics as a career? For veterinarians, um, I, I encourage them to take courses, uh, attend lectures at our CE conferences and trying to learn more. and. Now we have more and more textbooks out there. We pretty much have textbooks published on every species. So whatever their interest is in, um, there's actually now um, information that they can glean from that those resources. I think the best thing they could ever do is become friends with, develop relationships with those on the human forensic side and on the legal side, develop those relationships with pathologists and law enforcement and prosecutors because veterinarians don't tend to know their world. And it's important for us to understand their world, to understand their issues so that we can be um, better able to um, play on that team and provide them with what they need. I think most of all is, you know, veterinarians by nature are animal lovers and um, we, need to guard against bias 
and that we have to remain objective no matter what the case is, no matter what the alleged evidence is, that we still have to be objective in all our findings. That is some great advice. Dr. Merck, thank you so much for joining us today and talking to us about this fascinating subject. Okay, thank you.